Good afternoon. I'm Jessica Philippe. I'm the Member Engagement Librarian at the South Central Regional Library Council. Today's webinar is brought to you by the Design for Learning program, which was developed as a partnership among SCRLC, Syracuse University's iSchool, and the Empire State Library Network. And it was funded in part by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Today's speakers include Arden Kirkland, who is the coordinator for the D4L program, Lorene Roy, who is a professor in the School of Information at the University of Texas at Austin, and we have four program alumni panelists today, including Amy Besson, Beth Lewitsky, Kathy Michael, and Jennifer Shimada. So now I'll turn things over to Arden. Great. Thank you so much, Jessica, and thanks everybody for coming today. Can everybody hear me all right and everything and, and see my first slide? Yep. Great. Okay, so let's jump in. I just have a, a kind of brief introduction about the program in general. Um, so let's get started with that. So, um, so as of May 8th, this is kind of a big month for us. We've, um, we've made the first two modules of our program available to the public for free and on demand at webjunction.org. Uh, we'll be rolling out the rest over the next two months. And I want to mention here the diversity module that we're going to focus on today uh, will officially launch on Web Junction on June 5th. But if, um, if after what we're going to talk about today, if any of you who are attending are interested in enrolling early, um, please contact me via email, which I'll share at the end, and you can join in with us now. Um, now, Jessica already mentioned a little bit about our, our partners. Um, we, this all has come together thanks to a grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Um, it's a, a collaboration among the three institutions you're seeing here. Um, now, our first cohort in the program began working in September 2015, and the second cohort began working February 2016. They included participants from all over the country, from all types of libraries, subject specializations, and library experience levels. And based on their feedback about the program, we've made it even better to share on Web Junction. So uh, some of them are here today to share their experiences with you. Now, the full program is composed of seven modules. Each one builds on the last as you work on developing a unit of online instruction for your own library, which you then can pilot during the capstone module. The modules are designed to take about three to five hours a week, some even less. And they're generally about two to six weeks. Um, most take about four weeks. The orientation and capstone modules serve as bookends to the five key content areas created by our course developers. Um, and, for example, in this webinar, we're going to focus on the diversity module, um, talking with Dr. Lorraine Roy, who developed that module for us. Uh, for our self-paced, on-demand modules on Web, Web Junction, we've added a few new features since our first couple of groups went through. Each week's content is now organized in a lesson format with open reflection questions and multiple choice challenge questions for you to gauge your progress as you go. There's also space for the reflection questions in our new D4L instructional design workbook. There's a different chapter for each module, which helps you to keep all your work together for a final portfolio. The workbook also gives you a place to continuously revise your instructional design plan for your final capstone project. And you'll hear more about this revision process of the instructional design plan from some of our presenters today. So that's, that's my little introduction to the program in general. Um, I'm putting up these le links here for a moment, but I'll also share them again at the end. And now um, I'm going to change presenters to Dr. Lorene Roy. Let me go ahead and change over to her. There she is. And um, Lorene has been so wonderful to work with. I'm really excited about this module. We've, we've been um, working on it for a while now, continuing to you know, improve, make it better and better based on what we heard from our first group. Um, she shares some great resources with you and really gets um, participants thinking about many different issues around diversity. So thank you so much, Lorraine. I'll hand this over to you now. 
Oh, thank you, Arden. Can you hear me all right? Yes. And can you see my screen? Yes. Oh, great, great. So I'm Lorraine Roy, and I was really fortunate to be included in Design for Learning. And I'm fortunate again to be able to develop this four-week module on diversity for D4L. Of course, I've had lots of help from other members of the team, especially Arden, and I'm also grateful to be able to view Dr. Marilyn Arnone's foundation module during the time that it took to revise this one. So that's a, a little bit of thank you, miigwech. That's in my language. Uh, that's thank you. So let's take a look at what the diversity module is all about, just as background. So what it does, it's really designed to support content that the learners will already have gone through, especially in the foundation module. And you'll see this in references to content such as learning styles and the universal design for learning. But here we have another type of foundation that we're building as learners dedicate themselves to becoming online teachers. And it calls on the learner to be personal, to reflect on what they themselves as individuals bring to a learning setting, and it calls on the learner to reflect also on what others bring to a learning setting. So in terms of, I would say this is indigenous worldview, uh, so this is a, a, a preview. Uh, interspersed among the weeks of the modules will be assignments, so things to watch out for and to be alerted for. There are brief assignments. And as Arden said, there are these reflection questions and then suggested readings. And I like viewings. If, you're, if you get all these pop-ups and sometimes wonderful little videos on YouTube, you'll see uh, some viewings that I think are really great illustrations of the different uh, aspects of diversity. And I'm also asking you to reach out to professional documents in our field in librarianship, supporting documents. So you'll find ALA, ACRLs, the Association of College and Research Libraries, Diversity Standards, the Cultural Competency for Academic Libraries document. I've also provided links to resources that, again, I've enjoyed, including TED Talks, StoryCorps interviews, NPR videos, and videos from other sources, as well as some academic articles. They'll help you touch on concepts such as mixed race heritage, depression, microaggression, same-sex marriage, food allergies, all those unique characteristics that make up the world around us and especially make up our own world. Early definitions um, come in and so some of the assignments and things that you will be able to do and explore and, and provide answers to in your own workbook include drafting your own working definition of what diversity is and that's something that you'll return to throughout your working career in life. Uh, you won't find that I've given you a hard and fast definition for diversity. Instead, it's something that you will develop. You'll start to review what others have done in terms of training material that exclude or include diversity. So we're asking you to look at an example of something and say, what, you know, what are they doing here in terms of this training resource and in including diversity or not? You will create an identity chart asking yourself who you are and note down words that reflect your family role, your background, your beliefs, your interests, what makes you unique and what you value about yourself. For example, if, uh, one very brief uh, version of myself is my introduction on Facebook and it's very similar to the content of an identity chart where I say I'm an Anishinaabe, White Earth Reservation, mother, daughter, sister, friend, writer, teacher, speaker, and music lover. You can also mention uh, in your introduction intersectionality, that there are many aspects to your personality and your identity. As a native person, this sort of self-introduction is known as protocol, and you'll also see elements of this indigenous worldview. For example, references to Dr. Gregory Cajete's writing about the orienting actions involved in leading a fulfilled life as an indigenous person. These are actions that include the steps of preparing, asking, seeking, making, understanding, sharing, and celebrating. He also discusses the place of being 
or understanding oneself and one's culture. And because being is so important, I often substitute it for the concept of preparing. I'm going to ask you to reflect back on the introduction you started with as you began your journey through D4L and the orientation module. You might revise that self-introduction based on content in your identity map. How will you can turn to le continue to learn about the place of diversity in your work? Then you may do this through your own customized checklist. You find resources to samples of other checklists, but some things may resonate for you and you'll want to remember those. Because this is your personal checklist, you can cut and paste from those documents. You'll again start to revise your definition for diversity and your design plan for whatever educational product you, that you want to want to create. So that's a real brief little overview of the diversity module. I'm, I'm so happy that you're starting to explore this. Uh, you can use this module for, for other purposes beyond creating instructional material. So Chi McGwitch, that's thank you very much. And I look forward to hearing from our cohort members soon on how they incorporated diversity into their learning products. Arden, I'll turn things back to you. Great. Thank you so much, Lorraine. It's so exciting to, to hear about how this module is continuing to move forward. Um, but yes, let's hear from some of our panelists now about their experience with DFRL in general and also with the diversity module. So we're going to start with Amy Basson. So I'm going to switch over to you, Amy. Um, Amy, there we go is the Instructional Services Librarian at Asbury University in Wilmore, Kentucky. And she's going to tell us about her capstone project and her experience in D4L. Thanks, Amy. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me and see my screen OK? Yes, great. Thank you. OK, awesome. So um, like Arden said, my name is Amy Besson. And I was from the first cohort with uh, D4L. And the project that I worked on was an online module um, for the topic research as a scholarly conversation. So just to kind of give you a little background, here is the topic that I proposed for this project in its final iteration. So it underwent several changes along the way um, as I determined what kind of student population I wanted to gear this towards and as I decided whether I wanted this module to be part of a graded class. Um, choosing the student population in particular was important as I worked on the diversity unit um, because different student populations may have different needs. Um, I decided to focus on our undergraduate students, particularly those that would either be taking an online class or a class that has a heavy online presence. So this looks um, a little bit like maybe some of those sheets that you saw Arden put up, which are kind of like the um, sheets that you're going to change over time because prior to the diversity module, I had worked on an outline for what my project would look like. And that included what kind of information I would include and how it would be presented. And this is part of that document. Um, an important part of the diversity module for me was the review process. So looking at what I had previously written, um, kind of using the lens of our new inclusion um, tools and ideas. It might be a little hard to read with all the text, but the red parts under each section are my thoughts or changes that came about because of the diversity module. So you'll see some of the changes when I show screenshots in just a minute, but I'll kind of quickly run through just what you're looking at in this little chunk of my outline. So the first red slip that goes there under the 1B2, um, I realized that the diagrams that I wanted to include I either needed to make sure that they were OCR compatible or I needed to provide um, alternative audio options um, to ensure that students with visual impairments could access the information. The second red under 2A there is that I um, was wanting to use an existing video created by North Carolina State University. Um, but after completing the diversity module, I realized that I needed to re-watch the video, thinking about it from kind of a cultural and gendered perspective to determine if it met kind of my more global and inclusive needs. The third thing um, there under 2B was I realized if I was going to gather quotes on a topic to use as examples, I needed to make sure that I collected them from a diverse subset of creators um, so that I was showing, a, a, once again, kind of a global view. 
And then the fourth under 3A is um, something similar to that for the source deck. I needed to make sure I look at a variety of resource types, publishers, authors, etc., to make sure that I'm um, showing an inclusive voice um, on whatever the chosen topic is. So the last few slides that I'm going to show you are screenshots from my actual module. Um, and I created this in Moodle Rooms because that's what we use um, as our LMS on campus. And at the top of the screen, you'll see just kind of my basic welcome message to the overall module of research as a scholarly conversation. Um, and then you'll see two of the initial pieces. The first is a discussion forum that the students complete about their own research process. And then the second thing that you see there is the first of the two diagrams that I referenced on my outline just a moment ago. Excuse me. <clears throat> Um, and this is where they're going to be, you're only seeing one of them, but this is, there's two diagrams comparing the process of researching in a vacuum to researching in a conversation. And you'll see one of my diversity module changes here is you'll note that there's an audio explanation that accompanies each diagram um, in case uh, OCR or other screen readers do not correctly read the diagram. Um, it also uh, accounts for students that may just have different learning needs um, than visual ones. So this screenshot shows that I chose to keep the already produced video by NCSU as part of the lesson. Um, in reality, students would be linked out and would watch the video on NCSU's library site. But for our purposes, I just wanted to see you to see what the video was. Um, and I determined in my review during the diversity module that although the voiceover of the video is male, the graphics and animation are cult culturally neutral. Um, and the video also provides closed captioning, which I thought was a really important thing um, to make sure for hearing impaired and other students for inclusion. Finally, this screenshot shows a conversation diagram that the students view. And this is to help them with the concept of conceptualizing voices. I wanted to show this diagram to you all for two reasons in particular. The first is it shows the shift I made to ensuring that a variety of voices are taken into account for a sample discussion. For example, you'll see, um, it may be a little hard to read, the text is a little small here, but um, the, the quotes are from men and women, they're from youth and older people, they're from people that are authors and speakers, they're from different cultures and ethnicities, um, so kind of getting a variety. And the questions at the bottom are also encouraging the students to start thinking in a more global way. So, you know, asking them to think about when did these words get spoken or written, what was the context, what is the cultural, political background, um, et cetera. The second reason I wanted to show you all this, though, was to show that my project is still a work in progress, um, and it will be for probably as long as I use it. Um, the topic and the chosen voices will have to be modified for each class. This is obviously a very simplistic example. Um, and I want to continue to make it relevant. Um, and I discovered that I need to create a simplified, ver simplified version of this to make the content more understandable for screen readers um, and just to make it uh, more adaptable for different student needs. Um, and so that's something that I'm still working on. So with that, uh, I'll go ahead and turn it back over to Arden. But thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Amy. I love seeing all that, and I and I love what you said there towards the end about the fact that it's that it's kind of always a work in progress. I think that's such a great point for us all to to be thinking about the fact that there's always that potential to keep keep improving. It can just keep getting better and better and better. So wonderful to see. Thank you. Next up, we have Beth Lewitsky. So I'm going to change over to Beth. There we go. Um, and Beth is the solo librarian at Buffalo Seminary, a private high school for girls in Buffalo, New York. And she's going to tell us about a project that she worked on there. Thanks so much, Beth. Here you go. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. OK. Great. Well, all right. So like Amy, I'm starting off with um, one of the steps in the diversity module that I found to be particularly useful, which was to really look at the instructional design that we did earlier um, in the foundation module and the other modules, and to edit it um, within the context of thinking about inclusion 
and diversity. So for me, this was uh, particularly helpful. Um, so I'm just showing um, that sort of extracted that part of of my work in the diversity module. So you know, the black is the original the original text. So my project uh, was to do a very basic run-through of the databases in my library. And my library, my audience is a high school, a small high school of, of girls. It's a girls high school in Buffalo, New York. And this would be directed at mostly sophomore students who may or may not be at all familiar with library tools. So um, pretty dry, really. You know, where are the databases? Um, and a little bit about usage. So I, I found it challenging to get beyond those mechanics and to think about how we can make this a more inclusive topic. So uh, you can see in red that I thought that it would be important, of course, to add images that reflect differences. Even further, really, I, I would hope that in the work that I'm giving the kids, that we can get a little deeper beyond images in uh, screencasts or curricular materials that show diversity, but really get the students to think more deeply about it. And that's something that this diversity module uh, really got me thinking about beyond just, you know, within the context of an online class, but how to do this with the students, how to get these girls to think a little bit more critically about these issues. Um, I'm lucky that my class is actually going to be more face-to-face, -face, um, a little bit blended. So I will use these types of tools that I'll continue to show uh, to, to sort of facilitate the discussion that's going to be in person. So I'll go ahead. Hopefully, this will scroll to the next part. OK. So can you see that? Hello? Yes. OK, Fine great. to the next slide. Looks great. OK, good. So this is the kind of thing that I would show them as I spoke to them. And have a re and if I was to do it uh, as a video standalone online, I would, of course, do a voiceover. But so here's a, a, a screenshot of our My Library Resource Center. Um, and you can see that when I took the screenshot, I mean, this was coincidental. But the books that I have showing, I mean, in, inherent in what I do is to try to, I kind of err on the side of materials that may be not necessarily mainstream. So just putting images into the screenshot, um, again, this was sort of accidental. My widget here, my new books widget, happened to show a lot of books dealing with um, you know, James Baldwin, a book on racism. That was just coincidental. There's a Bell Hooks book. So I'm glad I'm able to show these in the, in the, in the presentation. But it's also just sort of part of the practice, I think, as, as librarians with in education and in the public, especially, to, to be able to, to make sure that you're inclusive like this. So I love that the diversity module bring that to the fore and made it really explicit. So this is a screenshot of my library resource center. I'm showing the research databases there in yellow. Um, and then, um, let's see, what's, I can go to the next one. And I'm not going to go through this much. I would do. Uh, you know, the kind of standard differences, the, dat the research databases, and a little bit here on versus the open web or Google search. I would get into that with them much more. Um, but then using an example <clears throat> that might get them thinking a little bit more inclusively, um, and I would do this maybe in an online platform where I'd ask them to answer the question in person and or by an uh, a online chat, like Google Classroom. So my sample search comparison in this case was do a search in Google and then in a subscription database using the term, in quotes, Asian women, and see what we got. So I thought this was a, a good example to maybe start a deeper discussion. So you can see that I have this sort of assignment-based um, list as many differences as you see mechanically in the searches. but getting deeper in discussion and in our chat, what are the reasons for the differences, um, and having them do their own topic. So I mean, that's, that's really the main sort of my example, and, and really based on the diversity module. And it really, again, it really got me just thinking about how can I, can I uh, you know, make sure that, this is, that these issues and, and uh, uh, non-dominant 
uh, faces and voices are going to be part of the conversation here. So that's that's what I have. Thank you. Great, Beth. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's great to see. I, I can't wait to get to the Q&A at, at the end after everybody presents, because I think there's a lot for us to continue talking about here. This is great. Great. Um, Okay, so next up on our list we have Kathy Michael. Let me switch over to Kathy. So Kathy is the Communications and Legal Studies Librarian at Ithaca College in Ithaca, New York. And she's going to share some of her project with us. Um, I, I'll let you take it away, Kathy. Thank you. Thank you, Arden. Thank you, everyone. Um, as she said, my name is Kathy Michael and I am at a Ithaca College in Central New York. While I mainly work with undergraduate students, my interest in design for learning was serving a small group of executive master students who are distance learners. One of the faculty conveyed to me that the students needed to work on their APA citation skills. This inspired my program to motivate the students to download and use Zotero, a free citation management system. My short lesson described how to add books, articles, and websites to the Zotero software. On the screen are my seven steps for effective online teaching and learning as defined in the foundation module. It is not my entire plan. I think we saw examples of other people's snippets of their plans there. They tend to be multiple pages long once you get it all done, but this just, just provides a, an overview of my instructional design in a nutshell. Uh, I was impressed by my colleagues how they had the changes marked. I did not clearly mark my changes over time as your plan develops throughout the course. This is a, on my second slide here is my email sent to the participants a week before the lesson was delivered. My hope was that students would be motivated to download Zotero prior to the lesson. It was a decision that I had to make not to cover how to download it live. The course helped me work through some numerous decisions in trying to de design a program that really fit the needs of my users. One thing that I struggled with in the design was whether they should follow along with me live or not. So my program here was synchronous. It was a, a live session as we are today. As it might be difficult to troubleshoot an issue online with multiple participants, I decided instead to just follow up the lesson with a screencast as well as a web guide. So, I captured this photo from my live presentation. This was the introductory screen before I shared my desktop. The entire lesson was less than 15 minutes, and I believe the students were on their lunch break at work. So they're executive people that are actually in a business organization that are trying to get a master's degree as executive. So they're busy individuals. My research topic was the open internet and network neutrality. As a librarian, I am on a telecommunications committee which advocates for network neutrality. So you can say this is one of the first values of my work as a librarian. And the diversity module of the program caused me to really reflect on what topic and images I use and to be self-aware of my own values as an instructor. The master students take a technology policy course and we're likely familiar with this issue and maybe some of you heard it because right now they're trying to take them away again. So there's a lot of news on that topic currently. While I used Adobe Connect, our campus has a license to a new platform called Zoom that I can use in the future, and we did use that during the, um, during the course. The Design for Learning program introduced me to additional uh, tools such as Talking Community or ReadyTalk, and I decided on Adobe Connect because it is available on my campus, so it was accessible to me. With Adobe Connect, you can set up the room in advance. You can add or delete modules and set up the screen in a variety of ways. So you can see in the upper left of my screen, I set some housekeeping notes. Making sure that everyone can speak and when they can speak can be a challenge in a synchronous session. I included an agenda with my Twitter handle and my email address so that they could contact me in the future with questions. Just like today, there's a chat available for live discussion. I decided to have my video on while I greeted the students before entering the screen sharing mode where I conducted a demonstration. I asked permission and then recorded the session. So to recap, I moved from an introductory screen to a screen sharing live demonstration and then back to the discussion screen. That final screen included a chat module and a link out to a final survey. 
So this slide shows the email sent after the class and it included to, uh, links to those learning materials that would reinforce the lesson. Uh, Ithaca College Library has a Zotero guide for, use, for users on our website. It includes a how-to video with closed captions to post it to YouTube. In the program, we were introduced to a variety of screencasting tools. I used Snagit software and then uploaded it to YouTube. And for accessibility, I learned how to modify transcripts in YouTube to make sure that they're clear. If you just go with the default, sometimes it's, it's garbled. And then finally, assessing what you've done. Uh, I, we have Qualtrics, which is a polling software, and I sent that out after the class. And the one thing I learned, and hopefully I didn't do this today, is I tend to talk very fast. So hopefully <laughs> I, I spoke slow enough that you could follow along with me. And thank you for, for listening. And that's it. Great. Thank you, Kathy. No, your speed was just fine. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right. And I, I, and I think that's... Yeah, I think, again, that's a great example of how the, the program was a great opportunity to practice with those kind of things for yes. people. And I think also the fact that you did a synchronous project. I think many of our, our projects have been on a little bit more on the asynchronous side, so it's really great right. to see an example of something that, that you did in, in real time. So, Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Great. Well, we have, we have uh, one last student presenter today, so that's uh, Jennifer Shimada. I'm going to switch over to Jennifer. And there we go. Now, Jennifer is the solo librarian at the Relay Graduate School of Education. And she will tell us about her project. Thank you, Jennifer. Great. Thanks, Arden. Um, you can all hear me and see my screen? Yes. Thank you. Fantastic. So, um, like Arden said, my name is Jennifer Shimada. I am uh, at the Relay Graduate School of Education. Um, I don't currently do much instruction there um, due to other priorities since I'm a solo librarian, um, but it's something I'd like to do more of in the future. Um, and I'm a former elementary school teacher, so uh, I do have experience in instructional design, um, but mostly in person. And so um, DeepRail was great because um, it helped me think about how to translate that to online teaching. Um, and so uh, today I'm going to give a high-level overview of my course and the changes I made in my diversity module, and then I'll take you through uh, my instructional plan like some of the other presenters have done so you can see uh, what those uh, changes look like more specifically. Um, so our students at my graduate school are primarily first and second year students completing an alternative certification. Um, so they're really hungry for practical instruction that they can use uh, the very next day in their classrooms. Uh, so I try to find a topic that would teach them practical skills that they uh, can also teach to their students, um, while also being appropriate for uh, students at the graduate uh, school level. Um, so for my capstone for D4L, I decided to design a short uh, four-credit course on online searching. Um, so during that capstone, they would learn strategies and techniques to improve their online searches using both subscription databases and uh, web search engines like Google. Um, they would learn about the advanced features often offered by those search engines um, and tactics for planning, conducting, and evaluating their searches. Um, and then they can both apply this to their graduate school work as well as their everyday professional lives. Um, so in the foundation module, we built out that instructional plan that other people have shown. Um, and in the diversity module is where uh, I made the first substantial edits to my instructional plan. Um, some of those were based off of my own materials, like some other people have talked about. And so um, I wanted to make sure that any materials I designed were accessible um, to people uh, with different abilities and learning styles, as well as to people from various cultures. Um, but I also modified my uh, instructional goals a little bit. So um, those of you who are um, academic librarians probably recognize the ACRL Framework for Information Literacy. Um, that was also uh, referenced by Amy. Um, so originally, I was primarily focusing on searching as strategic exploration, just the nuts and bolts of how to search. Um, and I realized that the two uh, frames on the screen were also relevant to online searching, particularly when it comes to evaluating databases and search results. So um, I added that students will also focus on scholarship as a conversation, and authority is created and contextual. Um, 
I added activities where students would reflect on some of the questions listed on the slides here, like have you sought a variety of perspectives? What are the established authority structures that privilege certain voices and information? Whose voice does the information represent? And what points of view might be missing? So that's sort of a high level of overview of the changes that I made. Um, and I'll take you through uh, more specifically what those look like in my instructional plan. So um, like some of the others, the changes are in a uh, different color. This is uh, in purple as well. Um, so in my instructional goal statement, you can see there um, how I added authority is constructed and contextual and scholarship is a conversation. Um, in particular, students will come to respect the expertise that authority represents while remaining skeptical of the bias systems that have elevated that authority and the information created by it. They will recognize the ways in which databases and open web search engines exclude or hide certain voices and will actively seek out many perspectives, not merely the ones with which they are familiar. These skills and mindsets will help them to become socially aware, lifelong learners who are able to critically evaluate information in their personal, professional, and scholarly lives. Um, so that is sort of one of the overall overarching goals of the course that I designed. Um, so what does that look like? So in uh, the task analysis that I did, this is um, a very short snippet of it. I took out a bunch of stuff that um, is uh, not relevant to diversity. But you can see I made a couple of quick changes there um, when they're looking at uh, what is in the database and uh, how do they analyze search results. And then uh, when I'm thinking about actually designing the materials, um, I built sort of this checklist of um, as I created things, as I found readings and videos uh, for my instruction, uh, what are some of the things that have to be true? So you can see there that some of it is uh, accessibility related. So captions, transcripts, uh, readable by a screen reader, um, using the right fonts, using the right contrast, um, not depending solely on color to differentiate between concepts or ideas, um, and including alt text. And then there are two things there uh, that speak to more diversity of cultures and genders. Um, so images of people will include people of various races and genders, and readings will include a variety of perspectives. So uh, I am highlighting a few of the different uh, topics, um, instructional strategies that it would look like for the I had five topics in general um, that would, this course would cover. Um, so in database structures, um, We'll also talk about the benefits of um, the scholarly publishing process while also examining the structural biases uh, that are present there. Um, when we talk about evaluating sources, we can talk about authority as created and contextual, um, as well as the purpose of racial cultural bias on the part of the author. And when we talk about searching on the open web, uh, we'll talk about its benefits and drawbacks, including uh, whose voices can be heard on the open web that might not be heard um, in the scholarly publishing process, what are the pros and cons of uh, depending on the scholarly publishing process for authority, um, and things such as that. Um, so that's sort of the big overview of uh, my capstone. Um, I haven't actually uh, created the capstone yet or uh, that course uh, beyond the instructional design plan. Um, our institution is going through some major changes right now, um, so I was just sort of waiting for those to shake out. Um, but my goals for next year um, are to focus on strengthening our information literacy instruction at my institution. Um, so I have a feeling that uh, the work that I did through DPRL is going to be very useful as I work on that. So I'm really thankful for DPRL and helping me think through uh, one possible unit that I can give to our students. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. It's, it's exciting to, to hear, I guess, you know, that you've got, got changes afoot at your institution, but the fact that, that, that this will continue to be helpful with what you're doing, that's wonderful to hear. Great. Well, now we're ready to move into our Q&A portion of the webinar. So uh, let's see. I think we can all... Go ahead and if I can ask all the, the organizers and panelists to turn on your webcams and we can just get that started and have a little a little chat. There we go. And so I think we'll have all of us except uh, Laureen will have by voice but not on screen. Great. 
So let's check in, and we have um, Jessica will be helping us to check in with any questions from our audience. So I don't, yeah, I don't see any questions yet, but if people want to start typing in their questions, go right ahead. And in the meantime, I, I have a few questions if <laughs> while well, we're waiting to get some from, from our attendees today. Um, I, I have lots of notes I scribbled while you guys were talking because it was so great to hear more and be, be reminded of your projects. You know, it's been a couple months since we were all really actively in it together, so it was, it was a great reminder for me to, to think about everything you've been doing. Um, so one question I had, um, well, let, let's just talk about how, um, other than just, you know, other than the capstone project itself, any ways, and so you talked about this a little bit in your, in your presentations, but any ways that your experience in this module um, has affected your work, you know, in, in other, other ways, other instruction, other parts of your job, um, and, you know, any thoughts you guys have about that, or I don't know if there are any particular stories about that. Go ahead, Jack. Oh, we need your audio. <laughs> now you can hear me, yes. There we go. Um, right when I was going through the diversity module, I'm on a campus where there was a very tumultuous time because the students were protesting because they felt the lack of inclusion and diversity on our campus. So um, all of us were actually at that same time going through diversity training and there was a lot of discussion on campus so it fit in really well. Uh, I actually sent out to colleagues the ACRL standards which I was not aware of before I actually took this class and um, there was a mention uh, by Dr. Roy that there were some uh, diversity checklists. I also share those with our Center for Faculty Excellence and some faculty that might be interested as we were compiling stuff to help one another learn more. So it came at a very fruitful time for me uh, here at Ithaca College. Hey, this is Loreen. You can't see mm -hmm. me? Can you hear me? Um, yes. yes. I really yes. think that we have, we're entering this new awakening of this topic of diversity. We are living through uh, a heightened 21st century version of the 60s here. Mm -hmm. And for many of us who've lived through diversity, it's as if finally people have turned around. It's like you're talking to, uh, I, I was called the pink wall. <laughs> uh, you, you can say, I think that wall should be painted pink and no one hears you and no one says anything. Mm -hmm. And some, usually it's a guy comes in, sorry guys, but says that <laughs> wall would be really great pink and then everyone says, what a terrific idea. And so you're happy that the wall becomes pink but you kind of say, what's going on here? So for, for the diversity community within the field of librarianship, this is a really exciting time. As If, if the University of Texas at Austin, where I am, finally adopts a diversity as a major, major issue. This is really exciting and you know why not be a part of it and each of us has have places to learn. You know as a native person, you know, I'm Anishinaabe and you might know us as, there are about 60, 70 names for us, you might know us as Ojibwa or Chippewa. Uh, it's, it's something you know you learn over your lifetime. You're not born learning this, it's, it's a continual learning. Uh, in terms of preparing for this module, I, I love seeing how people adapt what they find useful and what they're thinking of for their learners. But I, I also think that you're probably hear, going to hear and have heard the topic discussed more in your professional settings. If it's not your campus, your institution, your workplace, it's going to be at your conferences. And the word is intersectionality, we've used it all the time, but maybe we haven't called it that. So we are at this really interesting, exciting, blossoming era of the interest to learn, and this deals with political issues as well, the interest to make a difference, and for all of us, really, diversity can, can be it. Hey. That's backwards. I went on the Women's March, and that was my poster. I keep it here oh, on the desk. I love it. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to flip off and, and hear everybody, not flip anyone off, but turn my mic off. <laughs> Well, 
Maybe real, Beth, were you starting to say something? Or, and then if we have a couple questions, yeah. Yeah, real quick. I just, you know, you asked how it's affected uh, our work outside of just um, the the uh, D4L. And all. But what I wanted to say was that the material in this module really, I wanted, I've shared it in my presentations with the other teachers. So, I mean, I've, it's, I've really, you know, asking them to think if we're doing a presentation on motivation, for example, I did something last year, the end of the year motivation, making sure that they're thinking about kids who are coming into the school with differences, kids who might be part of the, the dominant group how can we get them to think about and be more respectful of the other students? So it's for me, it's really been great to to have that explicit, you know, uh, kind of instruction. How can you revise your materials to include this, and then sharing that with your teachers? I'm going to pop in again for just a minute. And part of the gathering of the resources was that I didn't want to have. You know, I don't ever propose this is the way you do things. This is my, you know, we all have our own way. But I thought that given that your audiences may be young people and older people and work people, that the, especially the videos I thought were effective. And every time I see the one about with Imagine where everyone's singing, oh man, I'm going to start crying now, you know. <laughs> and it's something that moves you and says, I can connect with this. I'm feeling something. And I think a lot of of issues related to exclusion, inclusion, consideration, you, you feel it first. And what does this mean that I have this feeling? How can I interpret this? And then you reach out, if you're a reflective person, then you reach out and, and try to consider what does this mean to me? What does this mean to others? So the so many times I think of this diversity module as a real self-reflective module. And if you, if you believe in, uh, in interested in mindfulness, this is kind of a, a, an area where it is right for a personal growth. So, so we did have a couple questions. Yeah. Joanne was asking, are you seeing an impact of the fake news on how you're presenting training and providing support for diversity and in designing instruction? Great question. And any of you guys want to jump into that? <laughs> I don't want to keep talking, but I, I'm definitely going to be um, kind of re, restructuring my class for sophomores uh, next year. It's going to be pretty much about, we call it evaluation. Now it's, you know, the hot thing is fake news, but I mean, we're going to be, I'm going to be focusing much more on that, much less on things like, you know, advanced searching and more just on evaluating and really being critical about what's out there. So that's going to affect what I do for sure. I don't think that it sorry, changes uh, really anything um, in that like this is always something that we've needed to teach people how to evaluate, but it's great because other people are talking about it. Uh, it gives us a hook. It gives us a way to say, like, I don't even actually love the term fake news because I think it's oversimplistic, but I can say that and it excites other people or draws other people in, and so I'll use the term even though I, don't, I think it's like a little in, inaccurate or uh, too small of a term, but um, I'll use it when I'm talking to people about like why I should come into classrooms, why I should talk to their students, why they should talk to, because our graduate students are all K-12 teachers, and so why our students should talk to their students about things like this. Um, so it's nice to have that hook. And for me, yeah. uh, as a communication librarian, I actually work with students in the fields of journalism and television. And one, one nice plug for my campus here is we have something called the Park Center for Independent Media. And the whole focus of the Park Center is to look at media that was funded not by commercial entities. Uh, so there's always that look. And a lot of the students in those communication fields will be writing papers where they're going to have to compare international perspectives to national to local or, or women's publications uh, to alternative presses uh, to black newspapers. So we incorporate uh, lots of different kinds of things and, and we, we regularly compare and contrast how news is being covered, how is the media being conveyed. So as, as you were saying, Jennifer, earlier, uh, we've always done that and uh, I think I'm hyper aware being with people who are actually generating uh, news. Yeah, I was just going to piggyback off of Beth and Jennifer, um, both kind of 
both and, I guess, for what you all were saying and the fact that, like, I, I, I don't think it's really that different than the other evaluation lessons I've already been teaching. You know, when I take in two different film critiques that have very different, um, you know, saw different things in the film, I mean, is that really any different than somebody that saw something different and reported, you know? Um, but it's great because I have had faculty that have specifically said, like, oh, we should talk about this, or, you know, it's the conversation starter, they're asking for that, and it's like, yeah, I mean, I feel like I already had those skills and I was already doing that kind of thing, but it's great to make it relevant both for the faculty and for the students, because um, I think sometimes it's hard to find examples um, that they can all relate to, and this is something that they've all heard of and that everybody is talking about and is familiar with. Good question. <laughs> We're turning lemons into lemonade. <laughs> Indeed. So, Lori asks, to, yeah. yeah, she says, diversity in my state also includes geographical diversity. Many of the online students have limited broadband access. How do some of you plan for streaming video during synchronous learning? So I'll, I'll start this one off. Um, one of the reasons that I had to narrow my student population was that exactly. Um, mm -hmm. If I was dealing with our adult professional studies students, I would have a very different approach because of that. Um, because a lot of the students have unreliable internet or don't make it to synchronous sessions because kind of like the executives um, they have very different lifestyles, and um, even if they're required, I mean, we can only get 60% there at a time. Um, and so if I were doing it for my APS students, I would make it much less synchronous um, is basically my answer. I would still want to have some of those options available so that if students wanted that kind of interaction, they could have it, um, but I would not make it a necessary part of my instruction. It would be much more watch videos on your own time, here are the readings, I would video myself talking, but it would not be trying to get 20 people onto a Adobe Connect session at the same time. One of the benefits of things like uh, accessibility and UDL is the fact that um, having those types of um, accessible documents makes it easier not just for, like if you have captions, for example, or a transcript, it makes it not just for people who have difficulty hearing, but let's say they're somewhere where their internet access is terrible and streaming a video is just a really bad experience for them, um, they can still read the transcript and uh, interact with your content that way. And so um, it's one of the big reasons why um, I, I really try to push for accessibility at uh, my campus, which is not something we have prioritized thus far. Um, because it is useful for um, a lot of different reasons. You know, uh, somebody can't have uh, sound on because, you know, they're somewhere, you know, they have a baby sleeping or something. Um, and especially given that our students are, um, all our students are in the United States, so we don't have to worry about, uh, you know, some of the more uh, other countries, but there's still all sorts of things that can affect uh, their time, their um, ability to sit and listen to videos. So I think offering the synchronous sessions is great, as Amy said. Um, it helps build community. Um, some people just prefer that kind of interaction. Um, but my course would be heavily asynchronous uh, for that reason, and there are definitely benefits to having the combination. Sorry, just as one more note, I will say that we do have students in other countries, particularly in our APS programs. It does add a whole other level to the diversity issue, especially if you're streaming things through like YouTube. Um, there are different rights for YouTube um, in different countries around the world, and so you have to be careful um, about the kind of materials you're trying to provide. So. Um, it's great in that it makes me think a lot harder <laughs> about what I do, but it also makes it a lot harder. So other things to keep in mind. Time zones, too, are a mess when you've got people all over and then trying to do something synchronous. Thanks, everyone. So Sandra has a question for Kathy. She says, you spoke of screencasting tools that you used. Could you repeat what resource you used? Uh, we actually have uh, Snagit on my campus. I find it's pretty easy to use. I just updated it. It can do um, a screen capture if you needed to maybe make a handout. Just do it that way. Or it can just very simply record what you're doing. So it's called Snagit. I'm not sure if anybody else had suggestions. <laughs> 
Yeah, I think um, among the group, I think there are a variety of things that you guys tried. I don't know if, if you want to recommend any others that you, that you tried along the way. Um, some people have mentioned Zoom. That is the um, video conferencing software that my uh, school uses. Um, it's pretty cheap for educational use. Um, but one of those things that we've done, it's, which I don't think is in its intended use, but we've used it a lot for, is to just get in a room by yourself and because you can record uh, sessions. Um, and share your screen and things. So we've done it that way um, for anybody who, because Camtasia is expensive. A few of us have licenses to Camtasia, but not everyone does. But everybody at my institution has Zoom. So uh, that's probably the most common one we use. What about Screencastify? I think that's one I've used, which I think is free. and It's very simple, but quite easy. Great, thanks. We also have some very nice feedback for Kathy from Kathy Smith. She says, thank you and congratulations. She was introduced to Zotero through D4L when you asked for volunteers to attend your first practice session. And she went back to school in January. And for all the essays, her instructor asked for them to have APA citations, and Zotero was very helpful. So. Oh, that's wonderful. That's great to hear. Thanks, Kathy. My fellow Kathy. <laughs> I'll just put in a little plug here for the, um, the last couple of questions. We're actually working right now on revisions for what, what for this group, this first two mod, the first two cohorts was called the Technologies Module, which we've renamed the Content Creation Module that does have, does deal with screencasting and, and you know, trying out different tools for, you know, developing your content. and um, so be on the lookout for that. That's going to be released to the public at uh, the beginning of July. And that does include lots of, you know, introduction to lots of tools like that um, to, to help with that process. So if that's something that you, you want to explore more, definitely take a look at that module. Great. Okay, yeah, we're, the next. We're coming up to three. I don't know if we have any more questions. I don't see any more questions, but I did want to mention the next webinar in this series, if you haven't already signed up for it, it's going to be next Wednesday, May 24th at 2 p.m., and that will be focusing on the community module. And related to this module, SCRLC is co-sponsoring a social justice summit on the power of active and engaged librarianship, and Lorraine Roy will be one of our keynotes for that, and that will be in Binghamton, New York on July 19th. That's great. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for thank coming. You. I will put those uh, links about the program into the chat right now before we go. And, um, and, I, and they'll also, of course, be online for any of you to follow up. So thanks great. so much. Thanks, Arden. I have a great day, everyone.